Well, hi everyone. I'm now I'm scared because it's <laughs> there's people sitting everywhere. Um, so yeah, as Javier was saying, my name is Luis Pieto. I work at DPFL in Lausanne, and I'm going to present a paper I have written in collaboration with Kshiti Sharma, Maria Jesus Rodriguez Triana, and Pierre Dillenburg from the Chile and the React Labs, both in EPFL. But before we, we uh, before I start, I wanted to ask who in the room is or considers uh, themselves a teacher, uh, aside from a learning analytics researcher. Okay, about half. Okay, um, you know, among those that are teachers, uh, do you remember a recent occurrence in your classroom where you know things didn't really get like go quite as you expected? <laughs> I, I saw even non-teachers are putting their hands up. Uh, yeah, and that's a bit like what this paper is a bit about. Um, so for those that did not, you know, put out your hand, I don't know if you have, I mean, you're learning analytics researchers, you think what you do probably can help a teacher at some point, but have you ever like walked a mile in a teacher's shoes, as they say? And I, I wanted to show you a, a, a Small video, it's like 20 seconds. And pay close attention because then I will ask a question. Uh, the sound is not very important. So, sorry about the motion sickness thing with the video. So uh, I'll explain a bit the context. So this was uh, filmed uh, in one of our studies in which we put an eye tracker on, on a teacher, basically, as the teacher was uh, orchestrating. It was teaching a lesson in this kind of multi-tabletop classroom that you see there. So ca can anyone tell me what do you think the teacher was doing? <laughs> yeah, like... Yeah, exactly. So the teacher was basically monitoring what the students were doing, who needed the help. Okay. So, and you know, you got that from like 20 seconds of totally uncontextualized video because, I mean, humans are pretty good at this kind of thing. And, and that's a bit like what we have been doing in educational research for quite a long time. We just, you know, went to a classroom, observed, or recorded a video, and then, you know, manually we tried to mark. Uh, you know, what was happening, what was not happening, and so on, because that's kind of like one of the best ways we still have to know what's going on with learning, how people learn, and in this case, how people teach. So, I mean, what we were asking ourselves is, uh, I mean, we, we have seen and we will see in these days, you know, people analyzing lots of LMSs, of MOOCs, and so on. But, you know, learning in the end happens in this physical classroom, so why should we stop at learning? Of course, we can get useful insights from analyzing the logs of Moodle, but why stop there? Why not also analyze you know, what, the, what happens in the physical world? And more concretely, so what we were trying to do in this paper is we were trying to think, I mean, this, this thing of you know, why stop on the digital and not go into the physical too is kind of like the goal of this multimodal learning analytics. You may have heard the word thrown around a bit because it's a small sub-community within learning analytics, but it is kind of emerging, it's growing, so we're interested in these kind of questions. And concretely, we wanted to know, okay, can we use this kind of multimodal learning analytics? Multimodal in the sense that we capture data either through the recording the video or the audio or, you know, any other data sources that can help us make the physical world a bit computer interpretable. So. Can we model what has happened in a face-to-face -face classroom? And, and, and I highlight the model word because, okay, so what do you mean by modeling what happens in the classroom? And this leads me to the notion of orchestration graphs. So I don't know if you're familiar with this kind of uh, diagram. Uh, so this basically is, uh, represents the activities that the students are doing in a learning sequence. So there's some, uh, these are social levels, so there's some small group activities here, and then there's a classroom activity, and then another small group activity. And this is pretty normal way of representing, for example, a learning design, an instructional design. But, and this is from one study we did 
almost seven years ago when I was doing my PhD back in Spain, where we were trying to see how teachers were integrating a new technology into their practice. So we went there and we watched the classes and we said, oh, the teacher, so the students are doing this kind of thing. So this is taken from another observation. But we also went a bit farther and we also wanted to see, okay, what does the teacher do to support these learning activities there? So we mapped, we modeled somehow by looking at the observations. Okay, so this is what the teacher is doing, uh, like an introductory explanation, all in parallel to support these learning activities that happen here. And we think that this kind of orchestration graph, this kind of model is very interesting not only for us as researchers to understand, you know, why maybe some classes work and some classes don't work even if they have the same instructional design, for example. And this can also be very interesting for teachers themselves. You know, teachers that want to reflect on how do I teach? Uh, where do I spend my time? Uh, what kind of activities I do most? And this is that, you know, the best way of doing it. But of course, like right now, the, the way we have to do this is okay. I just watch a lot, a lot of videos, smart, mark, mark, video code. And in the end, you get something like this. So isn't there, again, more efficient and easier way to do it? Because, I mean, if we think about the teacher, for example, if I tell the teacher in one month, you know, oh, what you did one month ago, now that I have finished my coding, is this. They will say, yeah, so what? I don't remember what are you talking about. So it's costly, it's slow. And we wanted to explore a bit I mean, a lot of people in multimodal learning analytics are working into like trying to model this part, like what happens with the students. So we wanted to look especially into this other side, no? And this is our research question then. Uh, so can we use this kind of multimodal analysis, these multimodal techniques to automatically extract these kind of orchestration graphs from what happened in the classroom? So we explore that. Uh, also because this is kind of like a novel line, like most people is looking at the student, not so many people is looking at the teacher. So, so we wanted to, like, to fool around a bit with the data, see which features seem to be more interesting, which data sources seem to be more interesting, what are the cost benefit trade-offs. So we're still exploring this. So this is not like, you know, we, we really know what the answer is. So we explored this in the, through a exploratory case study the context of this case study was very similar to what you saw in the video. So it was a multi-tabletop classroom that we set up in an open doors day in our lab where we tried to emulate as closely as possible a classroom or a classroom using this technology. Uh, we run four sessions of 35, 40 minutes each uh, with local uh, real school kids. And it, it's important to know that each class of kids was a real class of kids from a different uh, school, from a different village. So even if the instructional design, what we were trying to do with the kids was the same, you know, the unexpected occurrences of the classroom were very different in, in, in each of those four sessions. And as you can see there, this was like the, the main teacher of the session. It's a guy that looked very much like me. Mm -hmm. And so what we did with, with this guy? Um, well, the lesson itself, it was on the topic of geometry and coordinate systems. It was like, 10 to 12 year olds. And the, let's say the orchestration graph of what we plan to do was something like this. So there were activities in the whole class level and in the small group level. And there, I was trying to combine uh, a little bit of short lecturing, some game based activities using these kind of tabletops, uh, you know, doing this kind of uh, zigzag between small group activities and whole class activities. And the colors you see here, they are the different kinds of teacher activities that we called it, uh, like task distribution, like the teacher saying, okay, now you have to do this, explanations, questioning the students, monitoring as they work, and repairs, which means like solving questions and things like that. So the data gathering we did in these four sessions, you can see there. So there was a mobile eye tracker, like this kind of funny goggles. We had a mobile EEG like only one electrode. Um, we also had accelerometer because uh, we recorded the uh, a phone in the pocket recording the accelerometer variance of the, uh, of the movement of the teacher. And uh, the eye tracker itself, it has a camera here, which is what produces the video you saw. So we can get from there also subjective video of the session and the audio, the audio from here. So it focuses more 
you know, it will be very good at modeling the audio of the teacher, but you know, it doesn't capture really well what happens on the other side of the room. So, okay, we manually synchronize the different data sources. We chunk the data into 10 second windows, like to account for the different kind of sampling rates and so on. And what we wanted to do is to do a first exploration of the very basic generic features. So we, will, we are not extracting really specific teacher or teaching uh, specific variables. We wanted to see, okay, what can we do with like really basic stuff? So we did uh, several eye tracking features, like uh, you have the, the complete list on the paper, but these are usual eye tracking measures like saccade duration, fixation duration, <coughs> pupil diameter, uh, EEG bands, the accelerometer values. We did a bit of the video processing, mostly looking at whether the image was blurry. As you can see, like when you move your head, there was like a lot of blurriness there. Uh, and we did a bit of face recognition. So we tried to see like, how many faces. Right now I'm seeing a lot of faces. So, and that might be indicative of some things related to teaching, we thought. So uh, uh, other features related to what, how many faces the teacher was seeing at a certain point. And also the audio, like very typical audio processing metrics, like, I don't know, energy, uh, envelope, and so on. So the goal here, as you might have is, is we want to build a model that was able to predict from all these sources of data what was the teacher activity in this moment. So am I explaining, am I questioning what I'm doing? And at what social plane it happened. So I'm speaking to a whole room, I'm speaking to a small group, or what? So we tried different models from different families, decision trees, naves, and so on. And for the comparison and evaluation of these models, we did a fourfold cross-validation, which means basically and we were training these models on three of the sessions. And then we were testing to know is it accurate or not on the fourth that the model has never seen with the different set of kits and so on. And we use the, the Kappa measure for, for comparison between models. The results, so who's the winner? Um, for teacher activity, the model that best performed was um, a random forest to which we added some Markov chain uh, features in the sense that basically we were feeding back the predictions from the previous moment, uh, taking into account that, you know, if I'm now explaining, there's a certain probability that I will continue explaining, but there's also a certain probability that I will jump to other kind of activity. So taking into account, into account these, these transitions. And you can see there that uh, the accuracy was like 67%. Uh, Kappa was 0 0.56, which means it does much better job than, you know, a random guess, but still, you know, I, I bet I have not blown your socks off with this percentage. Uh, actually, for the social thing, it was much better. Uh, our best performing algorithm was a gradient boosted trees, and we got like about 90% accuracy with a Kappa of 0 0.8, which is well, pretty good. I mean, for such basic features we were using, I, I was surprised, actually. Um, another thing we tried, because as I said, I, we were trying to explore this space of features and what is interesting, what is not, uh, you know, why data source provides more meat. And so we ranked the different features that we have according to both the uh, these algorithms have their own way of like uh, ranking the different variables to see which of them are more decisive. And then we also use effect size through coins mini. And we got uh, that, for example, it, this is the ranking for, uh, this is also in the paper, so I, I do not need to read the whole thing, but you will see that there's a lot of Vs here, which means that there's a lot of video features. So that means most, the, the most important features were most of them from the video feed. There were a few audio, especially in the teacher activity, but the, the striking thing for me was that actually the pupil diameter was like the rank the first in all criteria and in all, like in both tasks, which I don't know, it was surprising. We can, you know, conjecture why is that. Uh, we have also done studies, for example, that uh, tend to relate like the fact that, you know, pupil diameter is also related with cognitive load sometimes. So, so, I mean, we make, can make conjectures, but I'm still not really sure. I cannot say for sure why. We also, in this exploration, we found that other interesting things. For example, at the EEG 
channel, like we did like also predictors built only on a single source, so let's say only EEG or only audio. And the EEG and the accelerometer by themselves, they were not doing so well. So maybe either they don't contain the right information we look for, or we just didn't get the right feature, which may very well be the case. Um, also, we found that if you compare like the single channel with the multi-channel ones, it looks like you know having this multimodality there's a value in it, so you, you get better performance by using multiple channels. But also we were looking at, okay, you know, like having this EEG, eye tracker, accelerometer, so it's like a, a lot of stuff on a teacher, I, I can tell you. <laughs> and but we were thinking, okay, can we do like reasonably well with less stuff on the teacher or with simpler algorithms? And it turns out we can, like if we only use let's say a, a support vector machine with only the top seven features, we get something quite close to like the best performing model. And also if we only use the audio and the video feed, we also get pretty good performance, which means you, know, you could just put a GoPro on the teacher and which costs much less than you know, this eye tracker and this EEG and so on. And it's still you could get something kind of meaningful out of it. So those were the results. So I mean, as I was saying in the beginning, this was the plan, like the, the instructional design, if you want. This is what the human coder found out that happened in this session concretely. And you can see, oh, well, I mean, there's quite a few differences there. So, and this is what the automatic detection gave us, which again, I would say not perfect, but I guess much better than this one. So, I mean, what our point is here is, you know, like, I like this misquote of, you know, no pun survives first contact with the enemy. And it's true, like, in, I don't know. In my experience, no learning design survives first contact with students. So then why assume when we do our studies and we, when we do educational research that, you know, our success or our failure is solely due to our instructional design? Shouldn't we also look at, you know, what really happened there is if it's a face-to-face -face interaction? Of course, we have limitations. Uh, well, the main limitation is that the teacher was me. And, you know, a small training data set with only four sessions. The recording setup is still way too complicated for a normal teacher to use every day, for sure. And we were using, like, only, like, quite basic features and algorithms. But now that you think of it, many of these limitations are, are not bad points. So we can get reasonable performance even with a small training data set. If they, even if we use a simpler recording setup, we could get something decent. And even with simple algorithms and features, we can get meaningful predictions of what the teacher is doing. And of course, there's the issues that, you know, I, I've been hearing a lot here today, and I bet we will hear more in the next few days about the issues of privacy, like who owns this data, who records this data, and so on, which I, I think they're still up there for, for, for discussion if, if we want to use this kind of approach. Uh, things that we are doing right now, we are recording other teachers in real classrooms in different contexts to, to see, you know, whether these results really hold in, in for other people. <laughs> um, we are exploring also more advanced features and algorithms, uh, like, you know, you see in deep neural networks that apparently in multimodal interaction they are getting very good results or going into like what this teacher actually says, like the content of the speech and so on. Uh, we are also working with teachers to explore what's their perception of this kind of idea we have. Do they find this useful? Uh, it, it turns out that some of them do, some of them don't. And again, it's, uh, you know, not everybody likes this kind of reflective approach. And we're also thinking like, I mean, we, we're doing here this classification on the basis of these five activities, these uh, social planes. But maybe that's not the more meaningful way to classify activities. So we are also talking with teachers and we are looking into literature, maybe pedagogically specific, uh, like, you know, categories for inquiry-based learning make more sense to be analyzed than these, ones, these generic ones that we used. So in conclusion, yes, we can get something reasonable from the orchestration, uh, a reasonable approximation to the orchestration graph with this kind of multimodal analysis. We have explored in the paper like several trade-offs in terms of data recording, the uh, computation, and so on. And 
but in, all in all, we think this is still promising, uh, still emergent, but very promising line of research, which could be in your lab very soon because uh, I have to announce that uh, I'm in the job market for the next few months, looking for my next stay <laughs> after EPFL, so that's there. And yeah, I think that's it. Oh, and I have to also say that we're in the job market that Pierre is looking for a postdoc in learning analytics in our lab there on the shore of Lac Le Mans. We speed the morning, we sail in the afternoon, and we wine in the evening. <laughs> that's not actually true. I've never sailed once. <laughs> but that's because I don't want. Thank you. So we have a nice time for questions. So, so who defined the ground truth in the Kappa comparison? The ground truth is the, the coding of the single researcher that did this. Uh, okay, and the follow-up question is, do you think if you add two coders, the Kappa will be really high? Because since you have this kappa 80 something, if between the two coders kappa is less than 80 something, you might have a problem. Yeah, I mean, in this case, I'm pretty confident about the coder because it was me. So and I, I'm pretty sure what the teacher was kind of thinking at that point. But it's true, it's true. It's, it's uh, something that... Huh? The teacher has to work Yeah, okay. exactly. So, but it's true. It's... Uh, that I think that's also a matter of the categorization in scheme. So if, if we do something very abstract, like, uh, you know, I'm using high cognitive questioning technique. Pfft, we can really discuss a lot about that. If I say I'm explaining, well, there's a good chance that we will agree probably <laughs> that I'm explaining and I'm not, let's say, yeah, repairing. But again, like some of them, yeah, I, I, I think the key there is to find the right categorization uh, scheme so that it's you know, concrete enough that you know, writers can agree, but it's still meaningful to, for a teacher that has to look at this, for example, or a researcher. Yep. So, um, neat talk. Thank you, thank you. Um, very cool stuff. So, a clarification is uh, for the one task uh, of predicting the level of interaction, you said you had two classes. Yep. No. Well, the, the thing is, like, the third class was not in the design, uh -huh. and it was practically absent in the actual enactment. So that's why we put it out. But yeah, that's a valid point, actually. That okay. we should have actually three classes of social interaction. Um, so when you're generalizing your results to other settings, you will need to have the caveat that you've only tested it in that configuration. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wonder if you've done anything like show teachers graphs and see how well they do trying to reflect on them. Yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, we are actually in the process of doing that now, but we have already done it, like, uh, at least with one teacher we collaborate very closely with. I, uh, I already, I was showing them. I mean, we have also other because, I mean, then we also were tracking, for example, the position in the classroom. So we were kind of giving a map of where do you move in the classroom which is also like interesting for some teachers. And, and I mean, yeah, like there, we are still in the process that we are still like, you know, working with a uh, few teachers here and there. And, but yeah, I mean, that's the obvious uh, next step. And some of them find, actually like the, this kind of orchestration graph, for example, some teachers are more interested in the, like the overview, like, okay, I spent 50% of my time explaining, maybe that's too much. But th th they find the orchestration graphs interesting. They find position. They, they sometimes they find in like surprising things in, in position maps. We have showed them. For example, oh, I never go in this uh, side of the class, and why? And I mean, sometimes it's very silly stuff. Like you know, it's, it's just like you know, going there is kind of hard to pass and because the class is set up that way. But if I just move the tables a bit more, I probably would mo go more there. And I don't know, it's things like that. Simply, no comment, just give it, that could be it. 
what the heck is this? Of course, if that's your goal, you don't have to have video tracking or something nearly as sophisticated. You can just track the position of the teacher on the grid. Uh, so it's probably a very accurate, low-cost method. But the real reason for that question is it's really hard to change teacher behavior. And what you're proposing uh, through the reflective practice kind of approach is let me show you a thing, see how you feel about it, um, and then the teacher may choose to act on it or not. But there's not even a, a, a normative take that says, like, perhaps you should act this way, right? And uh, my hypothesis, main hypothesis, is that uh, when it's very hard to get teacher behavior to change with normative thinking, it's going to be even harder to get behavior to change without normative thinking. So that's yeah. the business. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that you show a map of the classroom and say, maybe you don't even show it, you print it on the bottle of wine. So they don't pay attention and suddenly they say, oh, that's really Greek, wow. And no comment, maybe it's getting to the that this uh, pretentious pedagogical advisor that is going to tell me what I should do. And maybe that, that will be better. Not yeah, I mean, and if I can add another thing, like another problem with this reflection approach is not only like you, whether you change or not the practice, it's also like, like these suggestions that you make are based on what? Like it's based on, you know, this guy that came five minutes to my classroom and observed something, or is it something that this was really taken every day where I was there? I mean, like how much can you trust this recommendation? I mean, if I just show you what happened or what we think happened and tell you nothing, but this, this is taken from the whole 100% of your time, maybe you can trust that more and maybe you will do something about it. Actually, I mean, they, I don't know if that's related to what you're asking for, but another thing, the thing we are doing with another school in, in Lausanne is, so we are trying to do this kind of like very small, I don't, I don't know if I would call it student satisfaction, but very quick questions about the ex student experience in. Yeah, some sort of metric. Yeah, yeah, it, it, very simple yes, no questions. And then, for example, we ask teachers to predict that like what do they think will be the student experience and actually that's a study which that's running right now as, as we are here so i still don't know what will happen but yeah we're actually looking at something like that okay. Okay, thank you very well much. thank you